We've been continuing in a series in the Psalms uh, that we've been going through this summer. I'd like to begin with a quick experiment. If you've got a Bible, if you don't have one, then get one of the pew Bibles, please. And I want you to set your Bible up on end, maybe in your lap. And I want you to find about midway across the pages. Don't look, but just midway, and then one, two, three, open. Did anyone come, did you find the Psalms? Anyone find Psalms? Did anybody find the Psalms? No one. Oh, wow. Okay. What, what Bible are you using? I'm kidding. Now, if you're in Proverbs, you're one book to the right. If you're in Job, you're one book to the left. So anyway, you're close. You've got to be pretty close there. I thought that was pretty amazing. You're going to find pretty much Psalms at the middle of most Bibles anyway. And that's very helpful because then if when you're ready to go to the Psalms, to example, pray the Psalms, adapt them, you don't have to go to the table of contents. You just open it halfway and, and it's easier to find the psalm from there. The psalms, they are simply songs. They're songs. Divinely inspired songs. And as we've noticed throughout the series, they are psalms that cover a whole spectrum even of emotion. A whole spectrum of emotion. One psalm will take us to the heights of joy and celebration for what God has done for us and even just for who he is. And then another psalm will take us face to face with our sins and we confess our sins and we find God's wonderful uh, forgiveness and his mercy. But then there's other psalms that we find ourselves struggling with God in. That is, we're expressing our own personal struggles with God. God, why are you allowing the wicked to have such a a field day? God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why are you taking so long? God, I don't understand what you're doing and what you're not doing. You ever feel those kinds of emotions? They're very honest. And the, the thing is with the Psalms, we can be very honest. And yet what's especially important, I think, is to to adapt the the Psalms to our situations and pray the Psalms. And one reason I say that is because whenever we're expressing our struggles with God, using the Psalms, the Psalm will always bring us back to God. They'll always bring us back to reaffirm our trust in God, even when we don't understand exactly what he's doing and why. I want to illustrate that really quick. From Psalm 42, if you've got your Bibles there. Psalm 42. Uh, I'm from the uh, Texas Gulf Coast around Corpus Christi. Grew up there. Did spend a lot of time on uh, South Padre Island, just outside of Corpus Christi. And I remember seeing uh, young families that would come there and they'd have a little toddler, put them out in the surf, you know, just about knee deep. And he or she would just be having a good time. But then the waves would come in and they'd be about chest high and just knock him or her over. Just knock them over. First time they would think it's funny. But then just as they're getting up to their feet, another wave hits, knocks them over. Another wave, uh, wave will hit, knocks them over. And pretty soon they're not laughing at all. They're crying and they're raising their hands to their parents to pick them up. That's the picture here. Deep, verse 7. Psalm 42, deep calls to deep. It's like one wave calls to another. One breaker calls to another. It's a whole series. Something happens in your life that knocks you off your feet. Some crisis, some trial. And then just as you're getting up on your feet, then another one hits. And then another one hits. As you get your feet, just get knocked down again. And it happens. And you begin to do as that child. And you begin saying, God, first of all, what's going on? And that's what he does here. Verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forgotten me? But then as we continue to pray this psalm, adapting it to our situation, verse 11, notice how we end up. Why are you in despair, O my soul? David talks to himself. He calls himself soul. You ever talk to yourself? David does. He says, so, so, why are you in such despair? Why have you become disturbed within me? Calm down, self. Calm down. He says, hope in God. Wait for God, for I shall yet praise him. You see, he brings us back to reaffirming that trust. In a lot of the Psalms, in fact, the psalmist will go back in his mind to all the times that God had rescued him previously. So God has a history of deliverance. He has a 
a history of being faithful. And so then the psalmist will say, I don't understand what you're doing, but I know you're faithful, and I will trust in you. That's why we need to use these psalms. Adapt them to your situation. Pray these psalms. For today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 139. If you have your Bible, we're going to turn over there. Psalm 139, a very beautiful psalm, and one that's actually pretty familiar to most people, about the intimate attention that God gives to each of us. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for the psalms. We thank you for a book that really is so instructive to us and encouraging to us. Uh, Father, as we open the Word, we pray you would open our hearts to understand what we're reading, and uh, Father, help us to be more aware of your, your presence with us and your involvement with us in our lives from day to day, even from hour to hour. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I have five headings, five paragraphs that I see here in Psalm 139. I will begin each with a kind of a question that I think summarizes what David is basically asking and answering. The first one from verses 1 through 6 is, God, do you see me? With emphasis on me. God, do you see me? There are about 8 billion people upon planet Earth at this time. And God is attentive to all of us. So the question would be, how do you see God as viewing us humans? Are we just a mass of humanity that's just kind of blurred before God? Or does he see you? Does he see me? Or are, we, are we individuals to him? Or is each of us unique to God? You got to see this uh, next chart here. You've probably seen this. came out several years ago. I love this. Unique. You are unique, just like everybody else. Which well, sounds like you're not unique, right? All right. Next one we're probably a little more familiar with. What would be the caption of this? If you saw this poster, what would be the caption? You want to remember? Where is Waldo? Good. You got a lot of Waldo followers. All right, good. Where is Waldo? Waldo's this tall, lanky guy with a beanie and with a red and white stripe shirt striped shirt, and our challenge is to find Waldo out of that mass of humanity. And sometimes we have to really, at least me, I have to look and look and look. Does anyone see him? Anyone see him? Where? Where? Tall, the right corner? I thought someone said left corner earlier. No, anyway, you're probably right. Maybe they're, maybe they didn't see him, because all of them look a lot alike. But see, the question would be, so when God is looking at each of us eight, out of 8 billion, is he having to work at it? Like, at least I have to work at trying to find Waldo. Because Waldo, just to me, just kind of blends in. Do we, do, is that what happens with us? Do we just all kind of blend in with each other? Does God have to really work and work to pick us out individually and singly? And I think the answer to that, as we see in this psalm, is no. Absolutely not. We are individuals to God. Verse 1, Lord, you have searched and known me. You have searched and known me. And he's, he's looking back over his life and he says, this is what you have done with my life, Lord. You have searched and known me. The word search here, it means to examine carefully in order to assess needs. To examine closely to assess needs. Before I go out of state for a trip in my car, often I'll take my car to my mechanic and I'll say, hey, would you uh, check out my car? Uh, check my, uh, you know, my brakes, see if my brakes need to be replaced. Uh, check my uh, fluid levels, check my oil, my engine oil, see if it needs to be changed, would you? Uh, check my coolant, check the transmission fluid, um, check my tires, check the suspension, check the battery. And what I'm saying is, though I don't use the word search, is I'm saying, would you please search my car and assess any needs that I might have, any repairs that I might need or a replacement of things. Assess my needs. And that is the idea here. 
Except, of course, David's not talking about a car or about his chariot. He's talking about himself. God, you have assessed my need. You have examined me over the years. You have examined me and you have assessed my needs and you have worked in my life to meet those needs. He covers all of that in Psalm 139. In fact, he does this 24-7 in Psalm 139. If, uh, I'm going to read from verse 2 here. You know when I sit up, you know when, sit down rather, you know when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You're in heaven, I'm down here, but you still hear what I'm saying. You scrutinize my path, that is, you closely watch what I do throughout the day. And then you watch by lying down. You see, he's covering the daily routine. He's saying, God, you're, you're present and you're with me throughout the day. Let's say you get up in the morning, go down to the breakfast table, enjoy your favorite cup of coffee. You're going over the news on your app or maybe a newspaper. And the point is, he's saying here, God is there across the table from you. He's present with you. You go out to... Climb into your car, you're going to go to work, or you're going to school, or you're going to the gym. And as you get in your car and drive off, God is with you in the car. And by the way, he always takes shotgun, right? He always takes shotgun. Then throughout the day, throughout the day, whatever your activities are, God is watching you. And maybe you have felt watched at times. But he's not just watching you, he's watching over you. He's watching over you. And then when you go home, you climb into bed at night. He's the one sitting on the edge of the bed. He's the one tucking you in. And after you doze off, he's the one that's going to be watching over you throughout the early morning hours. And then the next morning, he's going to meet you down at that breakfast table again. That's what David is conveying here. And he does that with eight billion people. Incredible. Verse 5, interesting statement. You have enclosed me behind and before. You have the English standard version that you have in the pew. It says you have hemmed me in. You've hemmed me in. It, it's kind of like the picture I have is God has placed each of us in our own corral. And that sounds a little bit confining, but understand what he's saying. He's talking about his field of vision and he's saying that we can never escape or be lost from his field of vision. He can always see us and therefore always care for us. That's what he's saying here. In other words, his attention to us is full. It's undivided. He's never preoccupied. It's full attention. How many have uh, toddlers? You guys have toddlers in your life? Young families, good toddlers. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can be holding your little toddler uh, and you're, let's say you're preoccupied, but they want to tell you something, right? They want to say something to you. And, uh, but you're talking to someone else or maybe you're looking at something else and, and they're wanting to talk to you. And what do they often do? They'll, if your face is here, they're going to, you know, get right in front of your face. And if you look over here, they're going to move over here and they want to, they want to have eye to eye contact with you. They want you to look at them as they're, talk, as they're talking to you. In fact, sometimes they'll take their chubby little hands and they put them on either side of your face and say, Dad, Dad, Mom. They want your full, undivided attention. David is saying that's what we have from God. That's what we have, his full, undivided attention. In this connection, though, I do want to pass on, you've, you're probably aware, but child psychologists have determined the importance of eye-to-eye -eye contact, parents with the children. Uh, it's so important that when we talk to our children that we establish good eye contact. When they're talking to us, it's important that we establish good eye contact. And they say that this has a direct bearing on, for one thing, how sociable our children grow up to be. How comfortable they are socially is to a large degree influenced by the kind of eye contact we have with them. That doesn't mean we have to keep our eyes on them all the time, but just as a rule, as a rule. 
In fact, it's not just social, social ability. It's, it's also their self-esteem. You know, if a parent talks to the child, and here's the child, and they're looking over here, and they're talking to the child, and especially telling them something to do, they don't have good eye contact. The child gets the idea that they're not very important, that they have no real value. I mean, if the parents don't value them, then why should they value themselves? And it affects, it's a blow to their self-esteem. And they'll grow up that way. So just think about that. Think about that. We need to, as a rule, when we're talking to our kids, when they're talking to us, look at them. Have your eyes, uh, look into their eyes as you speak. Look into their eyes as they speak to us. Again, God has this kind of attention. Now, verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high, I cannot attain it. So as he thinks about this intimate attention that God gives to every one of us, 8 billion, he's saying, I can't understand that. It's too wonderful. Now, you notice that he's using wonderful in a way that, you know, when you talk about wonderful huckleberry pie with ice cream, it is wonderful. But that's not the way that David's using it here. He's using it to mean incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. Your knowledge of us humans, I can't wrap my brain around it. It's it's over my head. I can't fathom that. That's what he's saying. Throughout this chapter, by the way, as he talks about God's thoughts and plans for us, he keeps coming back to that word, as we'll notice. So, second paragraph, verses 7 through 12. God, is it possible for you to lose sight of me? I think this is what David's saying here. Again, first paragraph, God, do you see me? Secondly, is it possible for me to be in certain situations where you don't see me? Where I'm hidden from view from you, just as I'd be hidden from view of humans. That's the question. Where can I go from your spirit? That's the Holy Spirit. Where can I flee from your presence? Now, I will say right off, there are people who use that differently from the way David does here. There are people who ask that question and their whole intent and purpose is to try to get away from God's view, as foolish as that is. They're trying to escape God's presence. They're trying to escape especially God's accountability, that is, their accountability before him. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and then what did they do? Well, they hid tried to hide from God among his own trees, which is kind of funny. Hide from God. And of course, it didn't work. But they were trying to escape accountability to God for their sins. And today, there's still many people who are trying to escape accountability to God. They're asking the question, where can I flee? Because they want to know. They want to know if it's possible. They hope it's possible. There is a... And it's mostly ideologies that people hold to that, I think, where they're trying to escape God. One of them is called naturalism. Naturalism. It is the view or the algebra, the, the belief system that says everything is natural. There are no supernatural forces or powers. No supernatural processes, which is to say there is no God. There's no God. And so they believe, therefore, that life came into existence just spontaneously, that that billions of years ago in some little warm, warm pond somewhere, there was a series of chemical reactions, and the first living cell popped into existence, and then over another billion, billions of years, then you have that first organism evolving into all the life today. So we don't need God, and that's what they'll say. You see, we just thought that we needed God, but we don't. And all the while, they're trying to escape from God's telling them how to live. They're trying to escape God's holding them accountable for the way that they live. And this ideology is is just a tree. It's another kind of tree they're trying to hide behind. And it won't work. It won't work. Any more than the trees of the garden could hide Adam and Eve. It doesn't work. You can't run from God. You can run to him, and he he will receive you with open arms, but you can't run away from him. That's impossible. So David, though, he tells us what he really has in mind here is, and I'm rewording this statement now, he's asking, can I ever become lost to you, God, so that you cannot rescue me? Is there any instance where 
I'm so out of view of humans that I'm also out of view of you, God, so that I cannot receive your attentive care. That's his concern. And the answer, though, and he does answer it, is no, we cannot ever escape God's attentive care. Verse 8, he says, if I, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. Let's say you're an astronaut and you, you fly off into space and you get lost in space and you're saying, well, no one on earth can really do much about this, but does God even see me and can God do anything? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, he sees you. Yes, he can do things. If I make my bed in Sheol, now Sheol literally refers to the realm of the dead. I think he's using it figuratively here to refer to the deep recesses of the earth. Let's say you're lost in a cave like the uh, soccer team in Thailand was several years ago. You're, you're out of human sight. Are you also out of God's sight? And the answer to that is, again, no. You are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, verse 9, the wings of the dawn, that means if I'm super fast, I'm, I'm flying at Mach 2, can I go so fast that God can't see me? Then that God can't uh, minister to me? And the answer again is no. He says, even there, your hand will lead me. If I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, if I'm deep down in the ocean depths, can God see me there? And can he do something to serve me if I'm in need? And again, even there, your hand will lead me. In fact, we actually have what I've called a case study of that. And this is Jonah, the prophet Jonah. You may remember he tried to run from God. That didn't work. And uh, he ended up being thrown into the sea. And then God appointed a great fish, a big fish, to swallow him. And yet God kept him alive in the belly of the of the fish. This is God's supernatural power. So here he is in the belly of the fish. He's alive and he's thinking to himself, oops, I've really done it now because I have been knocked out of God's sight. He can't see me here. No one can do anything for me, not even God. I'm in this belly of the fish. Verse 4, here's where he says it. It's Jonah 2 verse 4. So I said, I've been expelled from your sight, God. Nevertheless, he says, I will look again towards your holy temple. What he's saying is, I don't think God can see me or hear me, but you know what? I'm just going to shoot a prayer up to God. I'll just do it anyway. I'm just going to shoot a prayer up to God, to his holy temple, to heaven. See what happens. We go down to read in verse 7. While I was fainting away, he's passing out. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Great reception. He said, it worked. I shot my prayer up to you in heaven and you heard it. And you acted on it. And we know that God had the fish vomit him back up off the, off the, out of the water. Sometimes though, it's not geographical separation. Sometimes it's emotional in fact, most of the time probably it is, where we feel that we are in a place emotionally because of experiences that we've been through, where we feel very alienated, not just from other people, but from God himself. And we ask ourselves, does anybody understand me? Does anyone really understand me? And we convince ourselves, no, they don't. But we also go on to think, neither can God. Neither can God. Can anyone understand me and, and beyond that does anyone care I, I'm going through things I don't think anyone ever has gone through and I, I feel so alone I feel so on my own I, I feel so alienated you ever feel that way we don't have time to read it here but first Kings 19 I'd like to encourage you to write that down first Kings 19 the prophet Elijah gives us a good example of that's where he was a wicked queen Jezebel uh, headed out for Elijah. In fact, she swore that she was going to kill Elijah because he had resisted her prophets, her idolatrous prophets. So she, she is trying to kill him, and he's, it, text says he was, he's running for his life. He ran 125 miles running for his life. You know, that's beyond an ultra marathon, isn't it? 
He ran for his life. He ended up in a wilderness and he just collapsed. No surprise. He's exhausted and as he's exhausted, he's also depressed. And he's feeling all alone. He's feeling, he tells God, I alone am left. No one else is even serving you faithfully, God. It's just me. So God, of course, he's praying to God when he says that. And God sent his angel. God heard him. Sent his angel. The angel fed him. The angel had him rest up, get back on his feet. And then God very gently talked to him, got him back on mission to finish up his work for him. Wherever we are, physically, geographically, or emotionally, God is there. God is there. And I want to assure us of that. That's the point he's making here. Third paragraph, uh, verses 13 through 15. So the question would be, all right, so God, you see me, and there's no place where you can't see me. So how far does this go back anyway? How long have you been watching me and and, uh, leading me, ministering to me? And so he takes us back, in this case, to the womb before you're born, before you're born. Verse 13, for you did form my inward parts. God, you, you formed me from inside. You weaved me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. There's that word again, wonderful. Incomprehensible are your works. My soul knows it very well. God, you're like a weaver and you, you, you weaved this beautiful tapestry called me inside my mother's womb. We know, for example, that God weaved us with a a beating heart when we were only six weeks in the womb. A beating heart. We were the size of a pea. The size of a pea with a beating heart. Six weeks. God weaved us in that way. At 23 weeks, he weaved fingerprints and footprints Onto us. At tw- and by the way, we were about the size of a mango then. And also, 23 weeks, he weaved within us an auditory system that, first of all, was able to identify our mother's voice, distinguish it, distinguishing it from other voices. He also gave us an auditory system at that time where we're able to actually learn songs that our mom is singing or that we at least hear around her close. He also weaved an auditory system that enables us to distinguish our mother's tongue or language from the language, some other foreign language. Isn't that amazing? We we, we couldn't even talk then, but we could still distinguish languages. 23 weeks, incredible. No wonder again, he says, wonderful are your works. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But you see, that's not all, okay? That's not all. So this is the, so God's attentive care was with us when we were in the womb. Now, what about before that? Is there anything before that where, where God was aware of us, present with us, and, and, and working with us before the womb? Well, verse 16, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Listen to this. In your book, they were all written. The days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. You guys have a day planner? Anyone use day planners? God has a life planner, a life planner. He's saying before God formed me in the womb, he had a plan for my life. It's incredible. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5 is a good example of that. Before I formed you, God says, talking to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, That's what we've been reading about in Psalm 139. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That is, I set you apart. I I dedicated you to being a prophet. In fact, not just a prophet, but he says, I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, don't ask me to explain how all that happened. And don't ask me to explain all the implications of that. I don't know. I just know that's what he says. And I also know he says it's wonderful. That is, it's incomprehensible to us humans. But it shows God's involvement with us 
even before we were formed and developed within the womb. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel pretty valued. I feel like God has put a, a, a stamp of value upon my life when I, I realize that. Each of us has a purpose, a God-given purpose, a God-given place, a God-given mission. We are not here on earth by accident. And we are not here, certainly not here, to wander about aimlessly trying to figure out who we are. And then finally dying after we enjoy a certain measure of earthly pleasure. That's not us. Verses 17 and 18. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. What he's doing here, I think David is standing back looking over what he said here. He's saying, I take, I, I take a look at, I mean, you, your thoughts and your plans for me as I'm walking this earth and your care over me and all the ways you were involved with me and then even in the womb, the way you worked with me and formed me and your, your plans for me being carried out there and your thoughts towards me. And then even before that, before I was even in the womb, your plans for me and your thoughts for me. And he says, I started tallying all this up. He says, it's vast. I start counting them, just like counting the sands of the seashore. You can't do it. But it shows the vastness of God and the vastness of his love towards us. Now, something comes up in the fourth paragraph, verse 19, that maybe knocks us off our feet a little bit. David has been, it's almost like riding a high, and we've been riding a high with David. As we think about how God loves us so much, and he's so attentive, so involved in our lives, and has always been. And then verse 19, David says, oh God, oh that you would slay the wicked. Depart from me, therefore, you men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Whoo, boy, that's a turn, isn't it? And I'll tell you, a lot of commentators that I read, they don't know what to do with that. Uh, what happened, David? Now, I don't think it's that hard to understand, though, how David could do such a switch of emotion. I mean, think about it. David has just talked about and been so keenly aware of God's love, his tender, attentive love towards each of us, towards all eight billion of us, even of the wicked. And then here's the wicked in his face, blaspheming God, throwing God's goodness right back in his face. Wouldn't that make you a little bit mad? That's understandable, right? Now, when he talks about hating them, when he talks about his, they, them being his enemies and he hates them, that kind of rattles us a little bit because Jesus has said, love your enemies, right? Love your enemies. How do we reconcile that? Well, I think that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, right? So, Psalm 83, I think has, a, I'm not saying it answers everything, but for me, I think it leads in the right direction. Psalm 83, we know from verse 2 that David is addressing in Psalm 139 the same people he had been addressing in Psalm 83. At verse 2, he speaks of, in Psalm 83, he speaks of these people as those who hate you. Now, we know from Psalm 139, that's who he's talking about here too. Those who hate you. Now he goes on to say in verse, <clears throat> verse 16 of Psalm 83, fill their faces with dishonor. In other words, God punished them for their wickedness. Now listen, what's the reason though? What's the reason? He says, so that they may seek your name, O Lord. He's not saying God send them to hell. He's saying God humble them, humble them. So often the, pri the, the problem when people reject is they're just proud. They're just proud and arrogant. But when God providentially judges us or punishes us, he can bring us to our knees. And then we start looking up. Not always, but many do. So David is saying here, fill their faces with dishonor. God, bring judgment upon them so that they may seek you. 
Then we turn to you. Now, at the same time, David does make it very clear. He hates wickedness. Wickedness. He hates the things that wicked people do. Wicked people are violent. They're dishonest. They exploit the weak. David hates that. God hates that. And we should hate that, right? We should hate that. Romans 12 and verse 9 says, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Stuff that's evil, we absolutely hate it. You know, the the challenge here is that we need to learn to love what God loves and learn to hate what God hates. Love what God loves, hate what he hates. And what that does is that aligns us, our will, with God's will. Last paragraph, verse 23, search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Now we notice in verse 1 of this psalm, he said, you've been doing this. You've been searching me. You've been examining me and you've been assessing my needs. Now what I think he's doing is he's saying, I have one particular concern primarily. I'm not concerned about you right here assessing my physical needs so much or maybe even my emotional needs. But I am concerned about my spiritual needs. And God, I want you to search me, examine me, know my heart, and assess, he's saying basically, assess my spiritual needs. Are there certain thoughts that are sinful? Are there certain motives I have, certain intentions I have that are sinful? God, show me those. So we say, well, David, what's the problem? You mean, you're not aware of all your sinful thoughts, your sinful motives. What's wrong with you, David? And you see, the problem is, Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10 makes it clear. David's on track here. The heart is more deceitful, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is more deceitful than all else. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. What he's saying is there are certain Sinful thoughts that we're not aware of that we have. Sinful motives that we have that we're not aware of. In fact, even psychologists talk about defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms which occur at the subconscious level where basically what our heart is doing is trying to protect us from feeling guilty. We don't want to feel guilty and that's at the subconscious level. And so our hearts, our minds can suppress those attitudes that we know are wrong. Completely hide them from us. And so that's where we need God. David's right on track here. That's where we need God who searches the heart and the mind to reveal to us, to expose to us the things that we shouldn't be, the things that are wrong, that are sinful. Now, how might he do that? Well, I think one way he might do that is simply lift that motive out of the subconscious into our conscious so that we're aware of it. We can see it and we can repent of it. And we can pray for God's strength of the Holy Spirit to help us turn from it. Sometimes I think he uses one another. Sometimes I think he uses us. A close friend might come to us and say, listen, I sense. We might even say, God has laid it on my heart. (laughs) There's some things that you're thinking that are not right. I want to encourage you. Humble yourself before God. Repent of that. In any case, what he's saying is that God is very conscious of the things that we think, and he's there to help us, we can draw on his searching ability to even learn more about ourselves so that we can walk more in harmony with his will. Worship team, would you please come up now? Worship team. You know, each one of us has a need to be valued. Each one of us has the need to be seen, to be heard, to be recognized So often when people act out or misbehave, sin, a lot of times I think what they're trying to do is to meet a legitimate need, but in an illegitimate way. They're showing a need that we all have, actually. 
but they're trying to fulfill or satisfy that need in a way that won't work. A way that's going to get them deeper and deeper in trouble. Well, the God who created us knows that we have this need to be seen, that we have a need to be acknowledged. In fact, especially we have the need to be acknowledged by our Creator, by our God. And He has invited us, God has invited us into a spiritual relationship with Him, a saved relationship with Him through faith in Jesus Christ, so our sins will be forgiven and we can be in fellowship with God. We can be in that relationship where we realize our worth. We come face to face with our ultimate worth, and it's in Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul is talking about the way the world views us and the way that God views us. And he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, the world sees us as the unknown, the unknown, the unimportant. But God sees us as well known. The, the world is never going to praise us. We'll never receive accolades from the world. We never will. Don't try. But God always recognizes us, values us, vindicates us, upholds us, and will glorify us. So the problem is not that we don't have God's full attention. We do. See, the problem so often is that God doesn't have our full undivided attention. That's, that's our struggle. And you see, that's why it was, getting back to Jonah, for God to get Jonah's attention, he had to have him swallowed by a big fish and taken down to the bottom of the sea where God then got his full attention. And sure enough, he, instead of running from God, he ran to God, didn't he? So, we might think that God has turned his back on us when we go through times that are tough, uh, when we go through trials. We might think that, well, God just doesn't love me. He's not being attentive to me, as he promises in Psalm 139. We might even feel sometimes like we're in the belly of a fish, <laughs> like our world is caving in on us. And yet all the while, all God is doing through those circumstances is he's taking our face in his hands and he's saying, look at me. Look at me. Listen to me. Run to me. Run to me. 